All right, so then this is the last part of the class, like I said, and this is where we're covering the last section and aesthetics. And basically that's a study of beauty for uh, philosophy. And so we covered a lot of stuff at the English this semester. We covered logic, we covered metaphysics, epistemology. Let's skip over ethics because I teach ethics over another course, but um, we did cover political philosophy. Uh, Santana's philosophy, philosophy of mind. So I think we went through a lot. But aesthetics is interesting, I think, because, uh, and this is why I left it towards the end, because aesthetics is really about if something can be objectively beautiful or not. And that's kind of weird for some of us to talk about objective beauty, whether something can be beautiful as a fact and not just an opinion. And of course, we start off with Plato and his ideas about what is beauty. And, and he has a very particular notion of beauty. And you're going to see this. He's going to reject the idea that art can be beautiful. He does believe in an objective notion of beauty. But art is not included into things that are beautiful. He doesn't think art can be beautiful. And why he thinks that has to do with the first reading. And art is imitation. So that section of the book is a section taken from the Republic, which is Plato's main book that he wrote. And, well, I mean, I guess they break it up, but they call it book 10. So the section of the, of the Republic Section 10, I would say, is where he starts talking about what role does art play in society. So you have to remember the whole thing, the whole point of the Republic, the book, is to figure out what makes a perfect society. How do you make the best society, a good society? And Plato breaks it, breaks it down in these stories, but he wants, he has, in these stories, of course, with Socrates, he's really arguing for a particular type of philosophy that says, well, this is what good really is. And when art comes up in the conversation, say, well, what role does the artist or the poet play in society? He's going to criticize the way that art and poetry are honored in society. So the whole thing, remember, is for him to develop this, this notion of perfection. So remember, we talked about the forms and how the forms uh, are the ideal, the perfect circular object, and everything is just a cheap copy of it. So he's talking about the same thing with beauty, that what is the true perfection of beauty, like what is the true form of beauty, and then what are cheap copies, what are things that are not really truly beautiful. So he starts the, the dialogue with talking about poets, and then I think it's kind of interesting and funny. So it's Socrates, the character, and he's saying, well, when I was young, I really enjoyed the, the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and so that's Homer. Homer is the author for those stories, and, and even back then, which I think is surprising, is that those stories are already classics for all these people. But he says, I enjoyed these stories, they're really fun when I was, when I was young, but he's going to say, but we shouldn't get too excited about giving Homer too much credit for coming up with these stories. And why is because he's a poet. He's a storyteller. But the problem with that is that, are these stories real? Do they, do they talk about real life? Is it something? Yeah something we can learn from. OK. 
can we learn something from a fictional story? Sometimes. We can apply it to real life situations, I guess. You would think so. And this is the thing. He doesn't think you can. That you can really learn anything from a story. Like, if it's this legend, like uh, the Trojan horse and all this stuff, he said, <clears throat> you can't really take from it true knowledge. It doesn't give you true knowledge. It gives you a fantasy. And even though the fantasy is entertaining, you don't walk away smarter. So I think it's not that different from what we talk about now with like celebrity worship, where, think about it, where we have celebrities who earn millions and millions of dollars, but they do so by, like actors and actresses, they do so by acting these fantasies out. If we give them all this money, but they're not really a doctor, they can't really save lives that way. But we give them so much money. And then people who actually teach, like myself, like if we try to teach something real, we don't get paid anything. So we celebrate these people who give us fantasies and the people who actually work and make a difference and talk about the truth. We don't give them much credit. And that's why he, and that's why he thinks the poets, they, and the artists, they kind of corrupt society. Oh, okay. So, I mean, that's what he's talking about in the story is that we give all this credit to celebrities and people who don't, who, I guess, like, if you play a doctor on TV, you know, they don't really save lives, but we enjoy the story so much so much that they, they get more attention and praise than the actual doctors, you know? And this is where he thinks art and poetry go wrong is that they get too much credit and they start making the fantasy more important than the reality. And they drive you away from what is true knowledge. So acting, like a doctor becomes more important than being an actual doctor. And that's where we've got wrong, I think, according to Plato, is that now this goes to epistemology. How can we say that that is really knowledge and more art? And so that's why he thinks that art is really a form of let me go back, of imitation. That art is just acting or imitating what it's, what the artist sees, but it doesn't really provide real knowledge. This is why he brings up the example of a carpenter. So if a carpenter can make a boat, like let's say they can build a boat, what do they have to know in order to build the boat? What kind of knowledge must they have? Um, I guess some, some math. They have to know how to do woodwork, how to uh, operate certain machinery. Yeah, absolutely. So they have to have these skills and good. So this goes back to what Plato was saying before. How do you learn the forms? Well, you have to have mathematical thinking. And you have to get away from your imagination and your beliefs, but actually have real knowledge. So this is why he puts, this is why Plato puts the carpenter kind of closer to the forms because they can actually build something and then you have to have some real knowledge for the boat to work so it can actually float. But if you think about it, take it a step further, and you think about an artist who paints 
pictures of boats, do they have to know anything about actual boats or how they work? No. Right. So then that's why he's saying that it's the artist is just doing an imitation. It's like doing a copy of a copy. So the carpenter copies the perfect idea of, of the perfect boat because whatever boat the carpenter makes, it's not going to be 100% perfect. So it's a step away from perfection. But even further than that, even a worse copy is the artist who just paints an image of what it looks, what a boat looks like. They have to have no knowledge of physics, of mathematics. They just can, it looks like this shape and that's good enough. And so this is why he thinks they corrupt people, it distracts people from real knowledge. And that they're not really good role models in society. They're just imitators. Same thing with actors, I think, and plays, is that they're just imitating or acting the part. Like I said, acting and pretending they're a doctor, but not really being able to save their lives. So that's why he thinks, in the end, art is not really beautiful. Art is just imitating things, but it's nothing real. Because then what would be beautiful for Plato in the end? Knowledge. But what, knowledge of what, though? Mm. Knowledge of life is what he seems to care about. Well, even further than that, this is why Plato living philosophy is kind of really bizarre for us. Because you can, like, if you look at the divided line, first you start with images, like your imagination, right? That's where, like, the artist would do is like they're just worried about an image of a of a boat the then there's the physical thing right the actual boat but then he says like to get a perfect boat to design a perfect boat let's say you're going to need math and math is going to give you the forms the perfect ideal boat that that would be real knowledge. So even your physical experience, your physical life is still not giving you 100% perfection. It's not the highest you can go. So he wants you to get even further than that. That's why the whole, remember the allegory of the cave where you're stuck in the cave and you're trying to get out of the cave? He's saying when you truly get out of the cave is when you go past what you see and experience and do something even deeper than that. Does that make sense? If it does, then it's fine, but I just want to know. Yeah, it makes sense. So this is so this is what he's talking about that artists don't really do that. They don't provide a way to get to real truth. Now this so it's so what would be beautiful for him in the end then would be something like mathematics. Mathematics gives you closer to perfection, and then because it gives you closer to perfection mathematics would be more beautiful. So art isn't beautiful for Plato. And I said something closer to mathematics would be beautiful for him because it would be something more objective. And this is where we get to the second reason, the symposium. So a symposium is, can be described, I think like the most basic way a symposium can be uh, 
understood it. It's like a house party at a really rich friend's house where there's free wine the whole night. And the only thing is that they have a theme that night. So like you go around and they pick up some topic or something and everybody takes a turn and shares what they think about that topic. And so it's supposed to be kind of fun because everybody's kind of buzzed. So you get to kind of say whatever you want to say, and, you know, and everybody gets to think about these things. And so in this story, Socrates is there. He's at this person's party and he's drinking like everybody else. And the topic for that night is what is love? And they go around and then where it's, the story starts is they get around finally to Socrates. And they're like, Socrates, you're really wise. You know, I'm pretty sure you have something to say about what love is. And Socrates starts talking about it and says, well, actually, he learned what love is from somebody else. And there's different types of love. So this is actually, I find really interesting about this particular story is if you notice all the other stories with Plato and Socrates, Socrates is always teaching somebody something. He's always the one asking questions. But this time, somebody is teaching him and the person who's teaching him is this, what I guess you would call priestess, Diotima. Oh, did you guys get the warning right now? What warning? Oh, what warning? We're going to run out of time. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, I got the warning, yeah. <laughs> uh, if we do, I can just stop it, and I'll just open up a new meeting again and just log back in. Okay. Um, but I don't think it'll actually take that long. I think we're going to wrap it up. So Dalatim is this priestess, and I think it's really interesting that of all the people who's going to teach Socrates, it's this, it's a woman. So this time it's like, uh, he confronts everybody and they're mostly men, but it's a woman who teaches them what love is in the story. And she explains like, well, there's all these different types of love and the Greeks were actually really good at this and we're not. We use the term love, but we use the term love for all sorts of different types of love, like love between a partner, uh, love with your, between your family, love with your work, love with uh, music or something like, you see how we use the same word, but we mean all these different things. And the Greeks were actually good because they gave different names for different types of love. And Diotima tells him, there's a, love is like a ladder in that there's different levels of love and you go higher and higher. And she's trying to get him to understand that the highest level of love is something really different than what we're accustomed to talking about as love. So she starts like at the bottom, you can say you love somebody, right? You're in love with somebody. And maybe what you notice, it's a physical attraction. Just you just, it's just very basic that way. But notice about physical attractiveness. Does it last? No. Yes. No. Because no. <laughs> eventually, oh. <laughs> they, well, if you think about it, like if you love this celebrity, right? And I go like, okay, example would be, I have friends that really, like when they were younger, were totally infatuated with Johnny Depp. And at this point, they're like, I don't want to see that guy. <laughs> like, no, thank you. But because he doesn't look anything like what he used to look like, right? He changed. And that's the problem uh -huh. that that team was trying to get Socrates to understand is that if you love somebody for their appearance, their physical attractiveness, it's going to change. It's Definitely. It's always going to be the same. So it's kind of a very superficial love type of love because you know that won't last and then that's like so that's why it's at the lowest end of the ladder like it's the most basic but you take a step further it's like well i love them for who they are okay 
So you mm. love something about their personality. So that takes yeah. it another level, right? And that lasts a little bit longer, right? Mm -hmm. But then she says, you just don't stop it there. You can even go higher than that. What do you love about their personality? Well, I love because they're really kind and compassionate. So then she takes it a step further. So you love kind and compassionate people in general. Like that's the type of person you love is like people who are really kind and compassionate. But you see how it, it's even more abstract. It's even further. And then say, well, wait a minute. It's not just kind and compassionate people. You are really in love with kindness itself. You love things that are kind. Why do you love things that are kind? Because they're good things. Like people who are kind are good people, right? So finally, this is the whole point is then, and this goes right to Plato's philosophy, then the highest form of love is love for good things because you love good itself. Do you see how that's even beyond an individual, like a partner, a husband or wife? Like you're, you can go further than that and be in love with good itself. Anything that's good, you love. That's the highest level of the ladder. That's why when we talk about it, and you'll see this term, I think we still use this term in a way where we describe that, like, have you ever seen those dating sites or whatever, and or whatever classifieds, and then they say, you know, what kind of relationship are you looking for? Platonic love is one of those types sometimes. And what they mean by platonic love is that you love somebody not on a physical level, you love somebody almost on a spiritual level, on an intellectual level. Like it's something deep. You love, I guess maybe the closest we can think of is like, you love their soul. Like that's how deeply you love them. And that's a deep relationship that doesn't have anything to do with physical appearance or age or anything like that. You're in love with their soul because there's something good about them. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So then that's why she says at the end then, and this is why I have the picture of Superman and he's reading The Republic, is that Superman is supposed to be good itself, right? How does he learn to be good? Is he read Plato? That was a joke, is that he learned what is true goodness, what is true love, not superficial. And he's able to get past that and then really appreciate what really matters. So she says, physical love begets mortal children. So yeah, that's basic. Like human beings, we get together. Physically, a physical relationship, a physical love, they'll produce children. But those children will eventually get old themselves, right? And pass on. They'll outlive their parents, hopefully, but eventually everybody dies. But when she says, immortal children, though, how do you get something, how do you produce a child that's immortal? It is a child of intellect, a spiritual, it's a concept, it's an idea. Like you gave birth to something that's deeper and more meaningful, that will last for, it doesn't, there is no time limit on it. I think that's like maybe Plato's writing is a good example. It's like it's thousands of years later and these ideas our concepts are still, we still talk about them. They still live. Like it's something that no physical child or no physical thing could do. So that's the type of love is that, that platonic love of, it's almost on a spiritual level, an intellectual level that you love good itself. Good itself doesn't have a time limit. Good itself will always be good. It'll always be worth 
what it is. So we talked about at the beginning, remember we started with logic, then we talked about metaphysics, epistemology. We really didn't get too much into ethics because I have the other class that I just primarily focus on ethics. But we did talk about political philosophy, social philosophy, uh, where we talked about justice and that's what the paper is for today. And then aesthetics is where we're at right now. Remember aesthetics is about beauty. And we talked about how when we talk about beauty, Plato and art, in particular art, usually we're accustomed to talking about art being beautiful. We, we make that association all the time. However, remember Plato is not making that association. He's actually against that association that art can be beautiful. Does anyone remember why? Why can't art be beautiful according to Plato? Did you say why can't? Yes, according to Plato, why is art beautiful? Not beautiful, yeah. Uh, maybe because everybody has a different opinion and nobody can agree on it? No, 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 more than that, deeper than that. Deeper than that, hmm. Because it, it, it's about opinions, but it's something about, he's saying that, what is art for him then? in the first place. How does he define art? How do you know it's art? He defines art by knowledge. No, because art can't give you knowledge. That's part of the issue. Art's not giving you any sort of knowledge. Why? Now you guys are getting me nervous about the reason. We did talk about this last week. So when he talks about art, he's saying it's imitation, right? That remember the artist who, let's say, for example, paints a boat. Do they have to know anything about the structure of the boat? Do they have to know about physics or uh, engineering or anything like that? No. No, they're just painting a perception, their image, right? What it looks to them. This is the problem that Plato has with artists or poets. And he calls them poets. I think we can um, talk about them in a more general sense, just artists, that they corrupt us because why they don't give us real knowledge he has a problem with poets in society artists in society they're not providing knowledge because they don't give you anything real they give you impressions they give you uh perceptions images so all i have to do is paint a, a painting that looks like a boat with no knowledge of actual boat I just have to make it look to you as a book. That's, that's the only thing I have to do according to Plato. But if we worship those people, if we praise those people, then that's where we go wrong in keeping things society. Is that they don't have any, remember epistemology is the study of knowledge. Homer is a poet. Homer does it, gives you good stories, they're entertaining but they don't give you knowledge. You don't become smarter after reading the Iliad or the Odyssey. You don't gain and grow as a person, according to Plato. So we get false sort of idols. We, we worship celebrities, I think I used last week, that worshiping celebrities, that their lives and what they do and give them all this money and give them all this praise, and let's say for like an example, an actor, he brings this up. What's better for society? Somebody who's a doctor or somebody who plays a doctor on TV? A doctor. So then why are we giving celebrities, actors and actresses all of this millions of dollars to play a doctor? To pretend that they know what they're talking about. 
payment purposes. But so why do we value them that way? I don't know, because humans love drama and they love how they act, you know, like on the movies and soap operas and stuff. And I don't know, I guess they just like the way that person acts. Yeah. It's entertaining, it's drama, you're right. It's a story. This is the whole thing, is then they become the role models for society. And the actual doctors that are out there, think about right now with the virus, the actual doctors and nurses out there helping people, they don't get the kind of attention or payment or credit that we're giving celebrities. And this is where Plato thinks. Yeah, really that's true. Wrong. Yeah, that's just exactly the problem with society. He thinks is that that's our values aren't in the right place. Our priorities are all wrong, and that the uh -huh. artists are getting too much credit and getting too much attention when the people who are closer to the truth, closer to reality are the people who actually do things that are out there, the real doctors, the real nurses, the real people out there. And this goes all the way back to his main philosophy. Mm -hmm. Look at the bottom of the graph. Images and imagining. Your imagination and what it appears to you is the lowest form because you don't need any real knowledge to imagine something. But the next step up is belief. So I have to believe something. Well, I have to have a belief of an actual object, right? But yes. So, right? So then, but then I'm not thinking yet. Those are just beliefs. Those are just my opinions. But they're not real knowledge yet until I can back it up and prove it. That's when Plato is saying, you're really thinking. That's the next level. And how do I know you're really thinking? Is you remember he has a really high view of mathematics that if you can back it up with mathematics, then you really know what you're talking about. And then you're really thinking and you're really using your brain. You're not just going by your opinions. They're stronger than that. But it's not the last level. The highest level, when you have true intelligence, when you have true knowledge, is when you know the forms. And the forms, remember, are the highest because the form is where you get mathematics from. Unless there's the form of circularity itself, you can't work out circular objects. You can't talk about pi. You can't try to figure out the circumference of diameter unless there's something that's circular in the first place and not a physical thing that's way down there on the visible world it's the form itself the perfect circle the most abstract and perfect is where everything comes from so the most the highest form the most important form is the good everything comes from the good and this is why i said christianity borrowed this remember with God, they replace good with God. They say everything comes from God. Everything, God is perfection. And that if you see the visible world line, that you can think about that as earth, right? And the intelligible world is heaven. It's beyond the physical, it's higher than that. And so remember in Christianity, your body, right? is not as important as your soul. And your soul is not physical, and your soul goes beyond the physical to the higher, to heaven, right? To perfection, to join God. All that imagery is copied from Plato's philosophy here. Instead of, but the only thing is that instead of good, I'm sorry, instead of God for Christianity, originally for Plato, it's the good. Because if it's truly good, it is perfect. Everything else you see on earth 
in your everyday interactions is imperfect. It's not truly perfectly good. So everything is striving to be good. That's why when we talk about in the symposium, when we talk about love, what is true love? True love is not physical love, right? It's not a physical attraction. True love goes beyond that. That's why for Plato, platonic love is the highest love. You're in love with the form. You're, you're way past the physical. It's an intellectual or spiritual love. Because remember, physical love, it's transitory. It's, it doesn't last. Remember my joke last time about Johnny Depp? I don't know if you guys remember. Yes. Know here, right? It's like people were in love with him, and then he's gotten older, maybe a little bit crazier. <laughs> and like people were like, oh, yeah, I'm not interested anymore. <laughs> And it's and if you just look at it <laughs> that way, then yeah, it's very superficial. So what Plato was saying is that true love has to go beyond that. And it's even further than just the individual. You're not but it's not the highest form of love, remember, to just love one individual for their personality or their soul or whatever. To really get to the highest point of love. Remember, Diotino talks about love as a ladder, like you're going up on higher levels. The highest level then is you're not just in love with a good person, you're in love with good itself. Because you love all good things. Not just one good person, not just your particular partner. You love good people. And if you love good people, even more important than good people is good itself. So that's why good is the highest form. That's the pinnacle. Which I think Christianity clearly, right? Actually, let me rephrase that. I didn't, I don't think, I know Christianity borrowed that exactly from some philosophers and said, well, actually, let's change that and say God, and God is perfection, and you're just trying to come close to God, right? Like, love for God is the highest thing. Which is right from, not so much from the Bible, but it's more from Plato's view. And that's why Superman, right, in the movie, he's reading Plato. He's reading the Republic. He wants to know what is true goodness. Because we describe Superman as all good, right? He's simply good. That's who he is. Now, questions so far? That was just a little bit of a review of what we covered last week. But are there any questions about that before we get into the new stuff? No. No. no? Okay. Now, I picked Danto out of all the reading because I think Danto is interesting. So Danto is an art critic for many years. And he passed away not too long ago actually and he was an art critic for many magazines and he's a philosopher of art philosopher of aesthetics and beauty and he wrote a lot of different articles and this one article he wrote in the 60s is called the art world and i think it's a really interesting article because essentially he's rejecting plato's philosophy about art and beauty and how is he doing that? So this is in the introduction. He, he lays it out. He's a good philosopher. He lays it out right away. He has a negative thesis and a positive thesis. His negative thesis is this. Art as an imitation, that's what Plato is arguing, that art is just a copy. You're just trying to imitate reality. Is neither necessary nor sufficient to be able to define art. That art, you can't just sum up art as trying to imitate real life. That's not what, art is bigger than that, essentially what he's saying. That Plato got it wrong. That Plato had a, just a very narrow-minded view of art. 
the positive thesis, which he's arguing for. So that's what he was arguing against. What he's arguing for here is that if art is more than just imitation, then there has to be a theory of art, what constitutes art, what counts as art, and what that theory is going to be, he's going to argue as a reality theory of art, that art has its own reality. It's not trying to copy reality. Art can exist in its own. It's not imitating. Does everybody fall so far on that? Yes. So in the article, he talks about the example of Socrates and Hamlet. So remember, Socrates is the character always in famous stories. And Socrates was the one that was saying, well, art is just like, it's so easy because the painter doesn't have to know, the artist doesn't have to know how, anything about real engineering or boats to paint the boat. What the artist does is just kind of like hold up a mirror to these objects and say, this is what it looks like. This is an image or, you know, some copy of what a boat is. But Danto points out in Hamlet, mirrors are interesting objects. Why? What makes you mirrors unique and interesting? They're kind of weird objects. Think about what can you do with a mirror? What does the mirror provide you that nothing else does? Huh? What was that? The mirror provides you with your reflection. You could see yourself. You can see yourself. Exactly. And isn't that something deep? No. Yes. Other, right. No other object gives you what you look like to everybody else. I mean, now we have cameras and stuff, but think about the time. Mirrors give you a view of yourself. And so there's something important about that and something that you can learn from that, that even though it's just an image of you, you can still take away maybe some important knowledge of being able to look at yourself, both metaphorically, right, and physically. There's something you can learn from it. And this is where Danto is going to say, why is art, this is where he starts his argument, why is art not just imitation? Why is it not just a copy? It's just a mirror. He brings up Kandinsky's composition number seven. So he talks about a number of different um, paintings, famous works in the article. And that's why I wanted to show you guys what some of these works look like because it's not quite the same just reading about them. What do you notice about composition number seven? It's abstract. It's abstract, right? And what in particular though, what is this opinion of? You may have an idea. Human faces? Perhaps, but there's, there's something more. Where, what's this, what's the setting? No idea? Mm. Is it tough to tell? 
Yeah. And that's Dante's point. Unless you know something about this art, unless you're familiar with Kabinsky's work, you can't really understand his work. If art was just imitation, if it was just a copy, then you should be able to tell exactly what he's painting here, what he's trying to convey. If it was just an imitation, then you should see right away what is it imitating. But he's not trying to just do a copy. He's doing something else. Actually, so this is a river in a city. Do you guys see it now? This is a river that runs through the city. Look towards the back. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Do you see what looks like a bridge? Yes. And then if that is a bridge, underneath is the water and boats and people and all sorts of action. The thing right now about Kabinsky's work here is that he's painting a river that he sees every day in the city that he lives. But it's more than just imitating what he sees. It's really about what he sees in the sense that it's not about being a photo and almost being a copy. It's about more about emotions, the colors, the action, the dynamics, the feelings. He's trying to convey something deeper than simply just taking a photograph. And I think this is what Dante was going to point out, is that it's art has to go beyond imitation. Sure, there's art that does imitate, but it's not the only kind of art. Art can have its own reality. It can do more than just copy. And there's two examples he talks about in the book. A really famous um, painting by Raphael on the left, and another one by Sir Edwin Landseer. What do you know, notice about these pictures, this art? What is the art of? What are the paintings of? Can you tell what the objects are? Well, one painting is, I think, the risen of Jesus, and then, a, okay. and I'm, I'm assuming in a forest or something. Okay. Good. So, do you need a lot of background about the artist to understand what they're painting? No, this one's not as difficult as the other one was. <laughs> Right. And so this is what Dante says. Yeah, there's this type of art that's imitation, like the, the stag on the right-hand side. It's trying to look like a picture. It's trying to look like a real stag, right? But it's not. And even deeper than that, when the artist has to paint these portraits or whatever this, like, of this stag, is that how nature really is? Does a stag just like stand there and wait for its painting? No. No. So when do you ever really see in real life a stag just standing there posing? Never. And when do you see Jesus? <laughs> you don't post either. You don't. And this is his point is that and a lot of artists were rejecting this. It's like, wait a minute, this is a really like this is supposed to be realistic, but it's really unrealistic. It doesn't really capture what life is really like. 
this was like a very model idealized life not really what life is truly like and this is where we get to the impressionist so he brings up the impressionist what do you notice about the impressionist here some of these impressionist paintings what do you notice about the technique and the in the brush strokes and things like that It's very light brush strokes, almost blurry in a way. Right. Why though? Why would it be these like light, blurry brush strokes? Why would it be these precise, very sharp images? Very sharp lines. I mean, why, why are the lines kind of smudged? Can you repeat that? You kind of broke up. Why are the uh, brush strokes very smudged and light? Why aren't they these nice sharp separations like these paintings here? Why are the lines just very messy? Because art doesn't have to be a specific way. You can use what You can do texture or very thin or completely because it's art. No, but, but why would you do that? Why would, I mean, they, it's not like Monet doesn't know how to paint it, right? With very sharp lines and stuff. I mean, Monet knows how to do this, but he chose to do this. Why did he choose? Why did he choose that, that difference? Like what made him change so that he paints in this style? It's for a reason. They, they planned this. What, think about action. Think about when you see things moving. It's blurry, right? I guess he wants to convey movement. In the painting? Right, exactly. There's movement. I mean, this is why it's about these sceneries. You want to convey that the waves, you want to see the distance. I mean, also, too, there's this look at the colors. Notice what are the tones of the colors? Are they very bright? What kind of color tones is he using here? Are, are they very dull? Like it's a very light blue. It's a very, like almost the whole scenery, right? Of the boat scene is very bluish with tiny hints of red. See how you have the classical painting of Raphael? See how sh bold the colors are? You see, so this is what they're giving an impression of it, of light and how light changes, like when the sun is going down, you can't see these bright colors. It's not realistic to see these bright, immaculate colors when the sun is going down. You see shadows, right? You see uh, these darker, deeper tones. And this is what, notice yet again, with the post-impressionists, and this is what Don Schultz points out, take the next step, take the next uh, revolution in painting. Look at the difference of portrait, of self-portrait in the, in the post-impressionists. So this is, on the left-hand side, is a very traditional self-portrait, something you would see like in a mansion or a castle or something, right? Very serious, very realistic looking, supposedly, right? Then look at Van Gogh's self-portrait on the right-hand side. What do you notice about Van Gogh's self-portrait? It's not very detailed. It's 
It's not very detailed, but what is it though? What does it have that the other one doesn't? It kind of looks like it has like an aura around it. Okay. So do you get some feeling from it? Do you get an impression of some feeling about it? Notice what's going on with the traditional self-portrait. I don't have really any sense of that man. It just looks very plain, like it's like a statue. But with Van Gogh's self-portrait, I get a sense of the person. I'm like, there's something about it, the tones, the colors, that give me a sense of who this person is. Roger Pry also has a really good picture scene self-portrait, but notice that in comparison with what you see Saison, for um, basket of apples. What do you notice about the basket of apples there? Something should be throwing you off. Something should look a little bit weird. What is it about the basket of apples that's a little bit off? Not quite the shape of the apples, but that's part of it. The apples are not uniform, right? They're not these perfect cylindrical things. But think about it. Are the apples moving? What's happening to the apples? Just look at the painting. What can you tell is happening to these apples? Or let's say they're falling. Happening. They're falling. There's movement. There's motion. Notice how he did that. You see how the angles are kind of a little bit weird on the napkin there? So this is, I think, very clever. What he did here is that when you look at an object and it's in motion, like a real basket of apples falling off the table, it's a 3D full dynamic object, right? You can see it from all these different angles. But when you have a very flat canvas, it's like that self-portrait. It seems you're only looking at it from one perspective, right? And you lose a lot of the dynamics and motion. So what he did there is he painted the table as if you're looking at it from different angles. If you're looking at it from the left angle, the center angle, and the right angle at once. So he's trying to convey like a full 3D painting and you get this sense of motion going on, this sense of action, these different angles going on. Because of course, this is 1895. He doesn't have a camera. It's not like it's this 3D motion or something. How do you work out that kind of dynamic on a flat paper canvas? But this type of art then looks really different from this, this type of art. So, and look even further. What do you notice about the people on the left-hand side? Is your dress good? Well done. What do, you, what do you notice about his painting? The people. What can you tell about the people? That's not how people actually look like. It's like a 
I don't know, like the girl looks kind of like a man with the nose and everything. So it's not really an ideal of what people look like, I guess. Well, it's not an ideal, but I see a lot of women with those noses. But it's not ideal. <laughs> like, this is, no, this is important. Look at their faces. Do you read emotion from their faces? They look kind of scary looking. They are scary. But they also are conveying something. Notice, go back to the very definite formal por like portrait. I don't get anything from this guy. He's a statue, like. But here, the brush strokes are messy, right? They're not precise. But I get emotion from the scene. I get a sense. Yeah, there's something going on. People are upset. It seems like if, if this is a place, it doesn't seem like a very friendly place, right? Right. And notice all this is planned, of course. I mean, the artist thinks about this, they plan it out exactly what you're going to feel and what sense you're going to get. And the regattas by uh, Dufay, that is, um, I think that's interesting because. When you go out to the ocean, and I miss the ocean a lot, but when you go to the beach or something, you see these sailboats, right? What do you remember about that event? What sticks out in your mind? Do you remember everything you saw at the beach? No then certain things pop out. This is why I think he's focused not on the boats, but on the sails. Because if there's sailboats, the big, bright colors, the flags, those are things that we would notice. Everything else kind of like blends in the background. It's not really that important, right? But there's something that pops out. And so it's more about your memory and that time and what you were feeling than it is about making an accurate photo. And the colors, like this, like blue just dominates, right? In that painting, the sky, the water, but the flags just burst out because it's such a stark contrast. So for him, being at, at the regatta, it must have been th that way, that the flags were these bright, sort of huge contrast to everything else around him. And this is where we get the father's in, which is interesting in itself. Take the next step further in, in art. What strikes you right away from the writers on the beach? Can you repeat that? Look at the painting of the writers on the beach on the left hand side. What what catches your attention right away about that painting? The pink. Right. Is that re really realistic? No. But this is why this style of art is not so much about realism it's not trying to imitate or copy what's around it it's making its own reality it's depicting its own world it's not trying to be a copy of all of it and i think that's the bigger sense like if you look at van gogh's the potato eaters which is interesting as well again what do you notice about this painting. Very somber. Right. Who are these people? Servants. They look like servants. So they're definitely people of not privilege or money, right? 
Right. The subject of the painting has changed. This is why we don't pay attention to this stuff sometimes, but it's really important. The previous paintings, the ones that we saw before, it's about somebody important, somebody who has money. Like that's who's going to get a self-portrait. It's rich people in mansions and castles. But Van Gogh wants to turn away from that. Like rich people have got enough of their, got enough attention. Thank you. It's like. What do everyday people look like? Why are they not art? Why is the subjects of art only relegated to the rich and powerful? Why can't we be the subject of art? And notice like the angles, you can't see the back of the person. I mean, you can only see the back of the person, right? So where does that put you? That puts you right in the room with everybody else. You're not standing away on the outside. It's not a movie in the sense of like, you're looking away. You're supposed to be right there with these people. And their faces are very, have a lot of expression and they're not beautiful faces. They're not pristine model faces. So that the subject of the art, how they're depicted, what's important, those are all choices the artist makes. And then this is where you get to, he brings up in the article too, Lichtenstein. So Lichtenstein is really famous, have you ever seen Roy Lichtenstein's um, work? He takes, he's very famous for taking comic books, old school comic books, and he blows them up to these huge like uh, mural size scale. So you take one little, comic book slice and then just blow it up into this huge mural. Why? Why is that art? What is he doing there? What do you notice now? What catches your attention when you blow up this comic book slice? Something should catch your attention, for sure. Mostly the detail. What about it? What do you notice about the colors? They're very bright. Exactly. And then what's interesting about these old comics? How do they convey action? How do you know action is happening in a, in a comic like that? Think about the explosive, like zong. That's not a word. <laughs> but even though it's not a word, you get an idea of what is going on, right? What the action is. But you don't pay attention to that normally when it's a tiny little comic book. But when you make it the center of attention, then you start looking in a very different way. It's not the same object anymore. And that I think is very different than what's going on here on the right hand side. Notice Savonek is just very boring actually to tell you the truth, but it's supposed to be, look at the subject matter, formal, important, Regal, it's not the everyday. And this is where I think it's, we get to think about the next step 
with abstract expressionism, which throws everybody off, I know. Because then they say, how can that Newman's work, how can that be art? It's just a big blue canvas with a white line down the middle. How is that art? Anybody can do that. So what is what are people missing though? What else do you need to understand of art? Of why he did that? Exactly. They're missing the knowledge of the artist. They don't know where he's coming from. They don't know what he's trying to expect, what he's thinking, and they don't know what he's reacting to. Art for Danto is it's a reaction to what came before. How do you rebel if you don't know what you're rebelling against? How do you take it to the next level going back, right? If you don't understand what came before, you're not going to understand the Impressionists and what they were doing and why they didn't do precise, nice, clean lines. If you didn't understand or know this was art, this was called considered beauty before. Like how, if that's what came before, how do you push it to the next level? You have to understand what came before and then do something different. And again, the post-impressionist, what's come before, and then they, they make it their own. This is their art. It's not a copy of what came before. And Cezanne, again, pushing it further and further to its own thing. So it's not about kings and queens. It's not about royalty. It's not about Jesus. Everyday artists everyday people can be the subject of the art and even further concepts themselves which i think is really interesting because that kind of, even though plato thought art was just about imitation i don't think he ever considered abstract expressionism because he might have liked it in the sense that ex abstract expressionists are trying to convey concepts not things they're trying to convey some justice itself, beauty itself, good itself, like it's something that can't, you can't take a picture of good, you can't take a picture of beauty. You can take a picture of beautiful things, you can take a picture of a good thing, but you can't take a picture of good itself. So how do you depict good? And taking what is the everyday to something deeper and extraordinary. So I want to skip ahead because it's going to cut us off, but Oldenburg is famous. If you go to a lot of museums, famous museums, I think in particular uh, one in Denver, if I remember the museum in Denver, has one of his works. Look at the works. There's just gigantic sculptures of what? Of everyday things. But they become extraordinary things in a different setting. You scale them up and you put them in front of a building and now it's magical. How do you get a stamp, you know, presser and like make that magic? How do you get boring pins and make that magic? It's about then scale, it's about context. It can't just be about the thing itself. You have to understand it within a particular context. And this is why he ends with talking about Warhol. Uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Andrew Warhol. But Warhol is really famous for doing the Brillo boxes. And why is it, and people were very divided. And this is where Danto was writing about. He just came from this exhibit in the 60s and he just saw these Brillo boxes. And what they are is just like he took, what Warhol did is take the everyday, a box that you would see at a store, took the graphics, but of course, these aren't boxes. These aren't real boxes that he has behind him. They're actually, I think, um, wooden panels. But he paints them like box front covers 
that look exactly like, but is he trying to imitate these boxes of soap packs? Not really. And he's getting to think about it. It's like, well, wait a minute. If you take this everyday object and you put it in an art gallery in the middle of something, it becomes something different. It means something different. So context is important. And I and lastly, Dante talks about the cave painters in France. So if you're going to France, the these are, I think at this point, the oldest paintings in existence that we found. They're 20,000 years old, but they convey something, right? There's a context to them. How did he make that movement from living our everyday lives and just doing everyday things to, I want to represent my experience. Like I want other people to see and and acknowledge my experience, what I've seen. I think it's a huge move from just basic survival of animals to let's take it to the next level. I actually want to depict my life. There's a deep level of that mirror I was talking about, that deep level of self-reflection about thinking about your own life and then saying, I want others to see that life. So to come back to his point, what he was arguing for is that art, there's, there's room. Yeah, sure. Art is about imitating things and making it look like what it's like a photo or something, but that's not what art is all about. Art is bigger than that. And that's why art is not simply imitation. There's, there's gotta be more to it. This is why Oldenburg's gigantic like stamp or something it's not trying to be a stamp it's its own thing in reality like it has it it's it's its own object it's not trying to copy on it and that's a real rejection in philosophy from plato's view of what is good and what is not any last questions before